Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and this week we're going to be looking at three different AMD Ryzen-based laptops, starting with this one from Asus. What's neat about these machines is that they cost well under $500, and I saw a bunch just flood the market about two and a half weeks ago, and there's a lot of them out there right now at really good prices. And what's great about these AMD chips is that they perform graphically much better than their Intel equivalents do at the price point. So today we're going to be taking a look at the Asus VivoBook 15. Uh, this one has a Ryzen R5 3500U processor, and at the moment it's selling for about $479. And we're going to jump into this in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that Asus let us borrow this for a couple of days to review. So we're done with this. It goes back to them. All of the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and take a look at this AMD Ryzen-based Asus laptop. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. This is a 15-inch laptop with a 1080p IPS display. I do wish the display was a little brighter than what I'm seeing here, but it's not terrible for the price point. The quality of the display, though, is nice. Nice and sharp, as you would expect out of an IPS screen. Uh, decent viewing angles that are a little more muted here under my studio lights, but seeming to work pretty decently for me. And I'm not seeing a lot of bleed through on the display either. Again, this has got an AMD Ryzen R5 3500U processor. Uh, it's got 8 gigabytes of RAM and a 256 gigabyte NVMe SSD. And you do have some upgrade options with this. It's not hard to take it apart. All you got to do is take the bottom uh, panel off and you can swap out RAM and storage. But on the RAM, 4 gigabytes of RAM is soldered onto the motherboard. And then you have an additional slot where you can put more memory in. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, with this configuration is that if you were to take that four gig socketed RAM out and maybe put in an eight gig module, you could get this to 12 gigs total. However, you risk performance degradations because uh, these AMD chips like dual channel memory for the best graphics performance. And when you've got two four gig matching modules, you can take advantage of that. But if you mismatch the pair, you risk stability issues or you'll see the laptop running slower because it can't run that memory in dual channel mode. So my advice with this one is eight gigs is probably the max you're gonna get out of it uh, because going beyond that will result in a mismatched memory pair. Also of note, they have two gigabytes of shared video memory with the graphics system on the chip. Uh, that's good for what I'm seeing on these Ryzen laptops. Some of these only allow for one gigabyte, so you'll have a few more options of things that you can run on this one. Now, on the storage side, you can swap out the NVMe drive inside for something bigger. Uh, that's probably ideal, given that uh, you'll get some really nice performance out of that, and the NVMe drives are dropping in price. Uh, but you also have room for a SATA drive as well, so you could get a SATA-based SSD and pop that in. Uh, but there's a little adapter cable that you'll need, and we didn't see it in the box with the one that we got from Asus. It's possible they packaged that in with their retail models, uh, but just keep that in mind if you intend on adding a second SATA drive to this, uh, you can install it, but you will need an additional cable to get it all working. Now, the weight on this one is 3.86 pounds or 1.75 kilograms. Uh, that, of course, will be heavier than more expensive laptops, but there are often compromises that are made to hit price points. On these lower price machines, it is their weight and their battery life. Uh, battery life on this one is probably going to be about six hours, give or take, uh, for light usage. And then if you're doing games or something more uh, strenuous, you'll see less battery life than that. These Ryzen laptops, unfortunately, are not known for their battery life. And that's something that you should be aware of if you are buying this. Keep the uh, power cords nearby. Uh, but the build quality is pretty decent. It's all plastic, but it does have a good feel to it. Uh, pretty decent range to where you can put the display. It's got these little plastic pieces down here that will angle the uh, keyboard up at you a little bit for better comfort. I have found with past Asus laptops that sometimes these things can dig into soft wood desks. Uh, but this one doesn't feel like it's doing that. I was running it across my IKEA desk here, and I wasn't seeing any new scratches being added to the mix, so they might have improved this over 
uh, prior models, but this is something unique to ASUS that I see, and it's kind of nice to get that keyboard uh, angled up at you when you have the display moving back like that. Not a touch display, by the way, but it's still pretty nice looking, as I mentioned before. Keyboard isn't bad here. The keys are a little on the smaller side, but they did get a number pad in here for uh, the Excel fans out there. Uh, it is backlit, which is nice. We don't always see that on low price laptops, so that was good. Trackpad is decent. It's pretty accurate, a little on the spongy side, but it works fine. It's a standard click pad, but you also have a fingerprint sensor built into it as well, so you can more quickly get into the laptop when you boot it up. On the left-hand side, we have two USB 2.0 ports, and if you plan on plugging in external hard drives, I would attach them to the other side because these are slower ports than what you'll see on the right-hand side of the laptop. You have a power light here and a battery charging indicator light there. On the other side, we've got more ports to look at. Uh, one is a micro SD card slot. Uh, the cards will go all the way in, so you can add some additional storage without taking apart the laptop with that. Headphone microphone jack here. You've got a USB Type-C port. Uh, this port, though, is only data. It does not do power or video out. Uh, but you can plug in your USB devices into it, either directly with a USB-C device or with an adapter. HDMI out here for connecting external displays. Over here, you've got a USB 3.0 port, and then here, you've got your power adapter for plugging everything in. So, that is the overall hardware. Uh, let's take a look now and see how it performs. All right, we're gonna start off with a YouTube video we're watching here on my YouTube channel. This is a 1080p 60 video, and we're playing it right now through Microsoft Edge. Uh, we're not getting any drop frames here. Now, when we ran the same video on Google Chrome, we did see some drop frames here and there, uh, which is exactly the same behavior we see on low-cost Intel devices playing this same video back on the Chrome browser and that's because Chrome still isn't really optimizing itself for some of the hardware decoding functions that both AMD and Intel chips have. So I would say if you're watching a lot of high frame rate video, switch over to Edge, and hopefully when they make the transition over to uh, the uh, Chromium uh, code base, it doesn't impact some of this performance, but really um, I think running it on the Edge browser is the way to go for now. Uh, we are going to switch, though, over to Chrome and just load up the NASA.gov homepage and see how quickly that all comes up. Uh, we're connected here to Wi-Fi uh, on my AC wireless network, and everything seems to be rendering in just fine. So I think doing web browsing, Microsoft Office, and Word, and PowerPoint, and all of that stuff should be more than adequate here and in line with what you might get from a three or $400 Intel machine. So really no issues here running the basics. Now in the browserbench.org speedometer test, we got a score of 76 on version 1.0 of the test, 40.6 on version 2.0. Uh, but take a look at how the other Ryzen machines are faring on that test. They're doing a little better than this one did. And I was expecting this one to be the top scoring Ryzen machine we got in given it has the more expensive and presumably more powerful Ryzen 5 3500U processor. But for whatever reason, it's not benchmarking very well here on this particular test, and we'll see something uh, similar on the graphics test we'll look at in a few minutes. Uh, but do take a look at the Intel i5 chip there at the top in the ThinkBook 13S. Uh, the Intel chips will do better, especially on this benchmark, uh, because they can be a little faster on the CPU side of things, but they also cost a lot more too. Uh, let's take a look now at gaming, because this is an area where these Ryzen chips really outshine their Intel competitors. So let's kick things off with GTA 5. We're running this at 1080p at 30 frames per second, and this is great performance for a low-cost, under $500 laptop. It's very playable. You'll see the frame rate dip a little below 30 here or there, but really it's a great gaming experience on a very low cost laptop. Uh, next, we'll take a look at the Witcher 3. Uh, we did have to turn the resolution down to 720p. We were getting about 25 frames per second, give or take there. Uh, so that one's going to be a little bit more challenging, but probably still playable. Uh, we also booted up the new version of Doom. Uh, there, again, at 720p, a playable 30 frames per second. Uh, it's going to be hard to hit the 60 frames per second mark on some of these newer games here, but the fact that we can get them playing at all on a sub $500 laptop, I think, is pretty significant. Uh, Rocket League also did pretty well. There we did get to 60 frames per second at low settings at 1080p. Sometimes it even got up to 70, so that was good. 
And we also booted up Fortnite. Uh, there, if you set it at medium settings, 1080p, which will render at a slightly lower resolution, we were getting about 25 to 40 frames per second. When we did 1080p low resolution, we got between 40 and 60 frames per second. So overall, a very good gaming experience here. Again, not going to rival a gaming laptop, but if you've got 500 or less to spend, uh, this is something that will get you playing some games that you won't be able to play on a $500 or less Intel-based laptop, and I think that's a pretty good deal. Now, in the 3DMark CloudGate benchmark test, we got a score of 11,629, and that really wasn't much better than what we saw out of an R5 2500U equipped machine. In fact, the test is looking almost identical, and if you look at the IdeaPad 330S, Graphically, it did a little better on its test run versus the Vivo book here. So this is really performing at about the same rate as a lower priced AMD Ryzen laptop. And I think it could just be how they decided to tune this processor in its BIOS for uh, the thermal profile perhaps they were trying to hit. So overall, the performance here is not spectacular, at least on the benchmarks. And as you'll see a little later in the week, we did push a few extra frames per second in some of the games out of that Lenovo that we were not getting out of this one. But there will be some other limitations on the Lenovo to be aware of. There's just no perfect solution, apparently, at the low end of the market. We also ran the 3D Mark stress test here to see how well this machine did under sustained load. Uh, there we got a failing grade of 73.2% which means you'll see some throttling, and that could have been going on during these benchmark tests, which might have resulted in those scores being about the same. So overall, not bad. Uh, it's performing nicely and much better than other sub-$500 computers, but I think you might be able to spend even less and get the same performance that we are seeing here. Uh, there is a fan on board, uh, but I found it wasn't all that noisy. You'll hear it come on, of course, when you do put the machine under load, uh, but I have certainly heard much louder fans out of gaming laptops and even some of the sub notebooks there. I think the fact that this thing is so large allows it to work with a larger fan that makes a little less noise. So the fan noise here was not offensive and it was pretty quiet overall, even under sustained load. And one last thing to check out, and that is its Linux compatibility. We booted up Ubuntu a little bit earlier. Everything was automatically detected just perfectly. So we got video, networking, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, all of the things that you need to get a working functional computer here. We're working just fine on Linux, uh, which is great to have a nice plug and play AMD solution here. So overall, I was expecting better performance out of this, especially given that this is a little bit more expensive than the other two you'll see later this week. And it's the only one that is running with the 3500U chip versus the 2500Us that will be on the other two. Uh, and it just didn't deliver that performance boost that its increased cost should have gotten us. But there are some things on this one that the others might not have. So you have to figure out exactly what your needs are and then go from there. So we'll have a lot more on uh, these Ryzen machines as we progress our way through Ryzen Laptop Week. I'd love to hear what you would like to see down in the comments below. Maybe we'll do a summary video of what we've learned testing these three different computers. And until next time, this is Lon Sivan. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Rajesh, Logic GR, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.